for the Imperium. Spice is used by the navigators of the Spacing Guild to find safe paths between the stars. I stand before you as Herald of the Change. We're witnessed by representatives of the Spacing Guild and a sister of the Bene Gesserit. Do you accept? House Atreides accepts! Hey guys, what's happening? Niad here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, today we'll be exploring the Spacing Guild, featured in Frank Herbert's expansive Dune Universe. The Spacing Guild, also called the Guild of Navigators, or more simply the Guild, and secretly known among its members as the Corpus Luminis Pre Nantiantis, the Union of the Foreseeing Eye, was an organization that held exclusive rights to faster than light space travel. The Spacing Guild and its navigators use the orange spice gas, which gives them the ability to fold space. The Guild was essentially an interstellar shipping and trade conglomerate during the years of the Carino and Atreides Empire. They were one leg of the political tripod maintaining the Great Convention, a historic treaty brokered between the Great Houses, the Spacing Guild, and the Imperium shortly after the destruction of thinking machines. Even Baron Vladimir Harkonnen pointed out the importance of the Guild, stating, We've a three-point civilization. The Imperial Household balanced against the Federated Great Houses of the Landsraad, and between them, the Guild with its damnable monopoly on interstellar transport. The Guild Spice-infused navigators steer their massive Holtzman Drive-powered Highlander crafts through folded space. The Spice Melange gave their helmsmen prescient abilities to see the future of all possible outcomes, enabling them to choose safe routes for their ships. With the destruction of all thinking machines in the Butlerian Jihad, the Spacing Guild was able to develop a unique monopoly in interstellar travel. We covered the Butlerian Jihad last week in my video on the Mentats, which I'll be leaving a link to below. But the underlying philosophy of the Great Convention was that of human life being precious and superior to all other forms of existence. While all the factions were relatively fractured, this was something everyone could get behind. Its principal guideline is that human life was to be protected. As a result, strict rules were put in place for wars and feuds between the houses. By mutual agreement between the Federated Council of the Landsraad and House Carino, the regulation was designed to prohibit emperors from taking sides. They would act as a neutral arbiter in situations of house-to-house -house warfare where an appeal to the emperor had been made by one side. The emperor was required either to render immediate assistance or convene an emergency security council meeting to deal with the matter. However, in matters involving the Butlerian Jihad and strictures established thereafter, the Emperor was given additional latitude to make decisions regarding punishment for those who breached the prohibition against thinking machines. Much like the Mentat Order, who took advantage of the absence of these computers, the Guild established a mental and physical training school after the Jihad. In fact, they were the second to do so, the first of course being the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, who we've also covered in the past. In the words of Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam, the Butler and Jihad forced human minds to develop. They had to either adapt or wither away. The Reverend Mother continued, there were two chief survivors of those ancient schools, the Bene Gesserit and the Spacing Guild. The Guild, so we think, emphasizes almost pure mathematics. Interestingly, in the same way only a woman could become a Reverend Mother in the Bene Gesserit, the Spacing Guild also only allowed mostly men to undergo the Guild Navigator mutation. With the mastering of mathematical knowledge paired with their prescient abilities, through the use of their navigators, the Spacing Guild held a monopoly on space travel for millennia. So vital were they to the functioning of the Imperium that the Imperial Calendar literally began the year the Guild was established. The origins of the Spacing Guild are shrouded in cosmic mists, not unlike the convoluted pathways a navigator must travel. In 177 BG, during the Butlerian Jihad, scientist Norma Senva extended the Holtzman effect to complete the theory of space folding on Poratrin while working for savant Theo Holtzman. She had spent a great deal of her life conceiving, designing and testing the space folder idea up to this point. The next year, Aurelius Venport released Norma from the contract that made her inventions the property of Theo. Venport then used the profits gained by his company Venki Enterprises to assist her in building the first actual space folding ship. Unfortunately, the ship endured only two years before it was taken from her by Lord Nico Blood and Holtzman himself. After leaving Poratrin, 
Norma was captured and tortured by the Titan Xerxes. This event unlocked her dormant powers to control her molecular structure and utilize formidable new prescient abilities. After killing Xerxes, she went to the planet known as Kolar, where she summoned her mother, Zufa Senfar, and Aurelius Venport, who had been looking for her on Seleucus Secundus. The three set about transforming Kolar into the first junction, a massive construction yard to build ships with Norma's new Holtzman engines. In 164 BG, Aurelius Venport was persuaded by High Priestess Serena Butler of the Jihad to offer the technology to their cause. In an agreement made on Seleucia, the Jihad would be given the Kola shipyard and could use the fault based technology for now. However, Venport and his company would receive the rights after the Jihad ended. This would be a setback to Venport's finances, but in the long run, it would extremely benefit Venki. By the year 108 BG, Norma Senva still couldn't find a way to fault space safely. Because a pilot had no way of knowing exactly where a space folding ship was likely to arrive, one out of every ten flights were lost. The ships often appeared in the middle of suns, black holes, or came crashing into planets without enough time for a pilot to react. Unfortunately, in the years between, Aurelius, who she'd married, died, and their son Adrian Venport had taken over. The first ships had used complicated computers with lightning-fast reflexes, but when the GR discovered this, they insisted on their complete destruction. Norma subsequently devoted all her efforts into finding a solution. As a result, she began to consume increasing amounts of melange to gain prescience and think with better efficacy. Against the suggestion of her doctor, Norma decided to give an answer to the navigational problem once and for all in 88 BG. She filled her room with extravagant portions of melange in gas form and had an epiphany. Her unique talents combined with the power of spice melange helped her realize the potential for carefully screened and trained humans to fold space safely. When the experience finished, she saw that her body was tragically deformed, resembling a dwarfish shape, only with an even larger head. She realized that for one to obtain such levels of prescience, they would need full spice immersion, resulting in total exposure and complete dependence. Establishing the Society of Mystic Mariners, which lay the groundwork for what would later become the Guild, her crews constructed an airtight clear plast chamber. There she could breathe melange in gas form, without the need for food or water. After the Battle of Corin, Adrian created the new Fold Space Shipping Company, whose space folders were navigated by prescience based on Norma's innovation. The monopoly of Venki Enterprises, renamed Venport Holdings through this company, did not last long though. It was essentially revoked by Jules Carino, the second emperor after the Jihad, resulting in numerous competing fault space companies springing up, like Celestial Transport and Escontran. However, unlike Venport Holdings, their competition was unable to guarantee safe travel. They had not made Norma's discovery an ultimate sacrifice, and so the key to interstellar travel and making navigators remained with Venhold. 85 years after the end of the Jihad, Norma Senva's great-grandson, Director Joseph Venport, ran the company with ruthless efficiency. The man dreamed of taking humanity to new heights of progress. Feeling slighted at his family's monopoly being taken away, he used his dream to mercilessly crush his competition and even kill rival CEOs. His company continued developing new technology and even tried to reverse engineer the technology of the thinking machines. Of course, this stupid move resulted in the fanatical Butlerians declaring Venport and his entire company their enemies, and the enemies of humanity by default. During the resulting struggle, which ended up involving House Carino, the Butlerians and Emperor Roderick Carino systematically reduced the company's power and assets. And just like that, Venport Holdings went from being the greatest economic power in the Imperium to nothing. During the Battle of Denali, frustrated at her navigators being killed, Norma entered negotiations with Roderick. They agreed to allow Venport Holdings to be destroyed in exchange for the formation of an independent spacing guild. Created from the former Fold Space Shipping Company, but not tarnished by the sacrilegious actions of Joseph Venport, this guild would unite the Imperium with safe Fold Space travel. I propose the creation of an independent spacing guild to serve commerce throughout the Imperium. Communication and transportation is the tapestry that binds our civilization together across countless planetary systems. Trade must be allowed to function unfettered by war or the threat of war. Under this new spacing guild, I will see that you will have all the navigators you wish and all the spice you need. It should also be noted that in the Battle of Corin, Norma continued to mutate due to excessive melange intake, described in this quote. Her direct physical senses were deadened, and Norma no longer cared about taste, touch, or smell. 
she found it remarkable to see webbing between her fingers and toes. Her face, once blunt featured and later flawless, now had a small mouth and tiny eyes surrounded by smooth folds. Her head was immense while the rest of her body atrophied, becoming a useless appendage. While Norma made the first melange guided journey through hyperspace as the first navigator, it came with a severe cost, damaging her brain before ultimately taking her life. While Venport and Sevna were lost, the society they created allowed gifted Tupilians such as Frello Mason to continue what was started by the pioneers of Tupile. Mason took over after Norma's death with the goal of ultimately transforming the guild into an interstellar shipping juggernaut. He was able to safely and steadily guide his crafts through hyperspace, and his son Jaster Mason, one of the great figures in the history of human commerce, expanded the fleet until he felt secure enough to make their abilities known by the year 12 BG but the road ahead was treacherous and one of danger. This guild can make us great. I tell you, we can be the wings of the Imperium. Right now, this moment, as we argue, a new humanity is being conceived, and we have the chance to shape that child that will be born. Hesitate now, and the chance will never come again. As the Imperium develops, that child will grow. And if we hide on Tupile for how long? A century? Two centuries? When we come out of our burrows and look at him, we'll see that he can fly all right. But his wings won't be guild ships, but they can be. We can be those wings, if we remember who and what we are and be bold. The company sent an agent named Zav to an imperial governor, Deneb, but the results were disastrous, locking the directors in a policy struggle. Unknown to himself, Zav went through mental conditioning that would end his life before revealing anything of harm about the spacing guild. When he met the governor, Zav offered the possibility of the return of interstellar travel, but in a fit of voracious greed, the governor subjected Zav to painful interrogation techniques in an effort to gain the knowledge for himself. Unfortunately, the governor kept pressing until the conditioning ultimately stopped the heart of Zav. Regardless, Mason's ambition and desire to honor his ancestors compelled him to push on. Zav died horribly, and we're all sorry about that, but we can't let it panic us. You say, be safe, be careful, but Zav wasn't. Norma Semva wasn't when the spice was killing her brain cell by cell. Venport wasn't when he took the fleet into the void. If the Ixians had been safe and careful, all of us right now would be sitting around a campfire wearing skins. Lo, he was truly a gigachad for the ages, and learnt much from this encounter. Now the guild did not dare to deal directly with the Sardica, who would find the location of Tupile. Nor would they approach the Landsrad, since the Great Houses would likely join to use the guild against the new Emperor. Mason also wanted to keep secret their use of Melanche, fearing this would be used against them. The debate narrowed on two choices, retreat back into secrecy, or continue trying to negotiate. Mason broke the impasse with his commanding words, and a unanimous board affirmed his ambitious plan. And so, another emissary was sent to the governor of Nabatea. This governor proved more temperate, but was of course skeptical a human navigator could replace the efficacy of computers that had been abandoned long ago. Naturally, he demanded a demonstration. With that, the guild forded space to travel vast distances across the universe, transporting him to the Imperial Court in three standard days, instead of two years. While confined to their own craft during the voyage and never permitted a glimpse of the guild ship or its crew, the Nabataeans were blown away. At this time, Emperor Sardia I was involved in dealings with the Landsrad over the formation of a government that would permit both parties to thrive. In 10 BG, Saudir arranged a financial synod on Aurarium IV, where the guild participated. The guild representatives offered Melange, representing it only as a spice that would extend human life. Importantly, they claimed ignorance of the source of Melange, and allayed any suspicion that spice had additional effects. The emissaries also warned against attempts to use the guild for purposes other than those that were negotiated. Although outnumbered, Jaster emphasized that the line must be drawn here, no further. More than that, if any action against the guild was entertained, they would retreat back into secrecy. They pointed out that no political entity could match the guild in space. Still, some of the great houses had ambitions on becoming the Imperial House and saw the guild as a means of ascension. But both the guild and the Emperor proved to be skilled negotiators, and Saudi eventually came up with the proposal of Combe. Also known as the Combine Hanet over advance of mercantiles, Combe would become one of the major galactic organizations in the universe. Most economic ventures were to be conducted through Combe, in which the Imperial House, the Landsrad, the Bene Gesserit, and the Spacing Guild would all have a stake. 
maintaining a gigantic monopoly encompassing all forms of commerce across the Imperium, and thus all economic affairs across the cosmos, Cohn would rely upon the Spacing Guild for faster than light space travel. The Guild grew immensely over the next five years. By this time, it was composed in part of members genetically engineered for special sensitivity to melange. This produced navigators and steersmen, whose prescience enabled them to guide spacecraft through hyperspace. There were also ancillary personnel, whose highliners maintained and regulated transportation between planetary systems. Guild highliners were immense in size, easily accommodating many thousands of passengers, whole fleets of smaller vessels and vast exports of planetary goods. With the power to fold space to travel vast distances across the universe in an instant, by 2800 AG, the Guild rediscovered hundreds of habitable, unpopulated worlds. Under the right of domain rulings in the Great Convention, the house paying the Guildsmen for a planetary find gained dominion over that planet, conditional upon the approval of the Landrad Council and the Emperor. Of course, no house could expect to meet the Imperial revenues demanded without being able to establish a workforce there, and since the house often could not populate the planet, most were content to relinquish all claim to a find, and offer it instead as an Imperial colony. If accepted, such an offer netted the house a handsome finder's fee, and left the problem of populating the new colony to the Imperial house. Being imminently practical in such matters, the Emperor would spread the costs and lost manpower with volunteer settlers. For millennia, the power of the guild was great, and in one case, they even named the successor to the Golden Lion Throne. Only when Atreides came to power was guild influence checked through control of the melange they required. The guild ultimately held the civilized worlds together until the invention of Ixian navigation devices in 14132 AG, breaking their monopoly. The Guild was, after the Emperor and the Landsraad, the third leg of the political tripod of the Imperium. Although it owed formal allegiance to the Imperial House, from whom it received its charter, the Guild was equal in power to both the Emperor and the combined forces of the Landsraad Houses. After all, every communication, travel, trade and military operation was dependent upon Guild approval. No great house, not even House Carino, dared endanger its Guild's shipping privileges through ill-advised infringements of the Guild peace. The Emperor himself was forced to employ spies and smugglers in an attempt to circumvent Guild control. The Guild was a fundamentally conservative organization because of the fear that technological advances in places such as Ix and Slalax would break their monopoly through new methods of space travel. Therefore, the Imperium, with its feudal structure and religious strictures against technology, was its only safeguard against these dangers. Of course, they also feared that supply of melange would be cut off, their only weakness. Because of this, the Guild allowed rubber stamp control over its charter to prevent any threat to the established Imperial Order. Only on Arrakis, the sole source of melange, did the Guild's policy prove ill-founded and disastrous. First mentioned in Frank Herbert's Dune, Guild navigators are mutated humans that worked as spacefolder pilots. It is essentially them that give the Guild their monopoly over space travel. In the novel, Paul notes the extent of power guild navigators had over discerning the future, saying, Think of that, the finest guild navigators, men who can quest ahead through time to find the safest course for the fastest highliners, all of them seeking me. Rarely ever seen, guild navigators are the backbone of space travel. This is because their limited prescience granted them the ability to see into the future and plot a course through the minefield of fold space. The navigators used an excessive amount of melange to boost their mental abilities to the point of prescience. From the first of them, Norma Senva, all guild navigators were mutated by the excessive amount of melange they consumed, making them develop weird features. Though rarely ever seen, there are a few cases where their original physical form is described. The excess melange intake by the navigators causes a biological mutation, forcing them to remain in tanks pumping spice gas to stay alive. This level of extreme and extended exposure causes their bodies to atrophy and change over time, with their heads and extremities elongating, causing them to become vaguely aquatic in appearance. The first external sign of melange-induced metabolic change is visible in the eyes, as the drug tints the sclera and iris to a dark shade of blue, called blue and blue, or the eyes of a bad. As mentioned in my video on the Fremen, this is a common side effect in all spice addicts. The navigator possesses finned hands and feet with an elongated body frame and repositioned limbs. 
Their face looks repulsive as they have a tiny mouth made into a V-shape and a flappy nose which cause their breathing to sound weird. Due to excess mutation, a guild navigator's voice becomes so bad that only translators make it possible for anyone to understand what they're saying. Because of overdependence on Spice, a guild navigator becomes practically useless when they're cut off from their never-ending melange supply. The Spacing Guild was, by its very nature, a secretive organization that took up functions previously covered by the thinking machines, just as the Mentats and the Bene Gesserit did. Their very existence rested on the proprietary knowledge and practices they'd clung to for thousands of years. The role of guild navigators was most prestigious, and the ambition of almost all who joined a guild. Other known roles included the chief administrator, the administrative staff, navigator attendants, guild ambassadors, and technical support staff. The organization was essentially divided into five main departments responsible for keeping everything running smoothly. Accounting, legal, security, operations, and two-pile. Accounting involved payroll and all financial records, while the legal team dealt with contracts and all matters involving the rule of law. Unsurprisingly, the security team was in fact the most efficient secret police organization ever founded. Not only did they have specialized teams involved in covert operations, interior branches to deal with stolen cargo, public relations officers, and ombudsmen to deal with in-house problems, but they also had a quality control team monitoring every single journey that was being taken. On top of that, they had their own subgroups of specialized guards and police. This ranged from basic crime fighters and investigators, anti-hijack guards, spice and sanctuary police to protect their reserve of melange, to their own secret police helping them maintain counter-espionage and security within the guild. Operations was in charge of the day-to-day -day activity of the guild. This branch dealt with everything from shipping in cargo, recruitment, advertising for tourism, planet evaluation, research and development, to training methods to ensure loyalty. They even had an Arakeen branch that tried to find a way to keep the occasional sandworm snatched from Arrakis alive. Lastly, there was Tupile, the home base of the guild whose location was kept secret. In addition to having personnel that maintained the operation and functioning of the planet, Tupile was also the retirement home of guildsmen, an advanced training center, and a hospital for those who needed special treatment. This is also where every ship in the guild's fleet is built and undergoes maintenance and repairs, making it one of the most vital locations that needed to be kept secret. The guild navigators were utterly dependent on the spice melange to safely deliver a vessel via the Holtzman effect. Even a partial restriction on the guild's spice requirements rendered them powerless and reduced long-distance trade and transport to a snail's pace. Paul Atreides was the first emperor to check the power of the guild through control of the spice melange. In the year 10191 AG, when the Arrakis affair boiled up, the guild made overtures to the Bene Gesserit. They hinted that their navigators were bothered about the future and saw problems on the horizon. Two years later, the guild lowered its price so that every great house's army headed to Arrakis with the Emperor Shaddam IV to stop the rebellious Paul Atreides. However, Paul threatened to destroy the spice if they did not ship all the troops back home. You have one last chance to take matters into your own hands and bring the situation under control on Arrakis. Remedy this situation, restore spice production, or you will live out your life in a pain amplifier. The guild was then forced to side with Paul, threatening to strand the Emperor and his troops on Arrakis if he did not relinquish the throne. They had no choice. Their limited powers of prophecy showed Paul was capable of it. And so, they sent everyone home, yielding to the control of the man who quickly became the new Emperor. Five years later, in a prescient vision, Paul saw a strike against Caladan and the rebellion of Landsrad nobles led by Memnon Thorvald. Paul also knew the guild was helping them. Because of this, he ordered the guilty guild navigator Beric to strand the rebel starships in distant space with no supplies. Seven years after the Caladan affair, the guild participated in another plot against the Emperor through Steersman Edric. Due to his relative power within the guild and his ability to elude Paul's prescience, Edric was a principal conspirator, along with Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam and Princess Urulan Carino, the Emperor's wife. Of course, she was Paul's wife in name only, because he was banging Chani and making mutated sandworm babies. The group's plot was discovered and revealed to Paul by his faithful follower, Othim. After Paul was blinded by a stone burner and disappeared into the desert, Edric was killed by Stilgar, along with all the other participants in the conspiracy. Although there remained a significant political power for some time, new problems emerged by the ascendancy of Leto Atreides II to the title of God Emperor. 
Leto's extremely long lifespan, coupled with his decision to realize the Golden Path strategy, saw him hoard the spice melange with no concern for short-term problems. Thus, over the many centuries, the guild was forced to do his bidding, leading to their unique power base of old significantly diminishing. While the guild remained a powerful body, even after the death of Leto Atreides II, their power gradually eroded over time. By the time of the arrival of the Honored Martris, the success of the group sent out in the scattering had created new, but largely unknown threats to their sovereignty. The newly developed no-ships by the Ixians, essentially starships that were invisible to prescience, could perform the same functions of a guild navigator. As a result, the guild no longer had the monopoly on space travel that gave the organization its edge for thousands of years. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore the Spacing Guild. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. You are transparent. I see plans within plans. I have ordered House Atreides to occupy Arrakis to mine the spice, thus replacing their enemies, the Harkonnens. So the Harkonnens will bring you a House Atreides? Yes. One small point. Call Atreides. We want him killed. The Guild and the entire universe depends on spice. He who can destroy a thing controls a thing. There are guild highliners above us. Send them back. How dare you speak to me in that? You're speaking. <laughs>